Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so I... Uh, this, oh, it is. Yes. Okay. Do I need to have this thing on or anything? Um, you don't need to, but I don't pick up your voice from there. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, everybody, welcome to Accessibility Testing 101. Uh, my name is Kara Golrap, um, and I am a, the Senior Web Accessibility Analyst at the University of Pennsylvania. So before we get started, I'd like to uh, give you folks a brief outline about the uh, structure of this session. So the first, uh, so first on our agenda, we'll be level setting ourselves um, for you know what we can expect from both from this session, but also you know going into just accessibility testing in general. Uh, the next, we'll go into what types of tools you'll need to build out your toolkit. Uh, next, we'll define the scope of what you'll be testing or auditing. Um, next, we'll go over how to use these automated tools, and then we'll go into how to do keyboard and manual testing of your site. Um, and then after that, we'll go into, you know, after we have all of these results, what do we do with that? Um, just a, you know, quick FYI, uh, I'll be going through more for the um, manual testing your site. We're not really going to cover screen readers too much in that because that can be a whole different section. But but if you'd like to learn more about screen readers, um, feel free to tap me afterwards and I'd be more than happy to go through that with you. But that's just a little out of scope for this session here. So <clears throat> uh, I like to start off with this quote from the World Health Organization. It says, disability is not just a health problem, it is a complex phenomenon uh, reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and the features of the society in which he or she lives. So the way that I like to approach just accessibility in general is the reason why we have to worry about these types of things is because we as technologists or designers or project planners, we have just made these inaccessible environments. So when we're thinking about this, you know, we don't want to put the burden on the user. We want to do everything that we can when we are either planning our project, designing our systems or developing, we are removing as many barriers as possible. Um, because uh, simply put, web accessibility means that everybody, regardless of circumstance, can use and contribute to the web. And oftentimes we think about web accessibility as something solely tied to helping those with physical disabilities. But however, accessibility extends far beyond that. Um, disabilities can be permanent, like having one arm, uh, temporary, like having an arm injury, or situational, like you're holding a baby. Um, so we will now hop into the level setting ourselves. Um, so before we begin, let's cover some ground rules to set our expectations. So um, if you're evaluating website code for accessibility errors, having a strong working knowledge of HTML and CSS will obviously make your job easier. Uh, for instance, knowing the difference between when to use an A tag, like a link, uh, versus when to use a button. So being very familiar with HTML and CSS is incredibly helpful throughout this, uh, throughout this process. Um, these slides are available on the session description on Drupal Camp New Jersey, and in the back of the uh, in the back of the presentation, I do link to some great free resources. Where if you do need a little refresher on just some HTML or CSS basics, uh, you can go there to you know ramp yourself up. The next is you want to be very familiar with your site's architecture and its functionality. So how is your site structured? Uh, are there common patterns? Are you using, um, do you have some type of component-based library system? You know, does each landing page have a side menu with submenu links? Um, so you want to know exactly what your site is able to do. Uh, you want to know the different processes your site has um, and the different roles and permission that your site has. Um, for instance, if you're reviewing a learning management system, you'll want to, uh, you'll want to review and test your site through the student role and uh, perhaps the faculty member role. Uh, the next is that uh, just know that automated tools pick up uh, less than 40% of errors, so you have to do manual testing. Um, you can't rely on these automated tools to pick up every error, and different tools pick up different errors. Uh, for example, um, for the test list item with no parent, uh, wave doesn't find the issue, axe does, <clears throat> and fae uh, asks that the user uh, checks for it. 
Next is that compliance does not equal a truly accessible site. Uh, just because there are no errors being flagged in the WAVE tool doesn't mean that you have a truly accessible, uh, does not mean you have a truly accessible site. Um, the best way to determine how accessible your site is is to test with real users. Uh, for example, the way that you or I use a screen reader is likely quite different than somebody who uses a screen reader every single day. Uh, in usability testing, uh, you may not find new technical issues uh, like page structure, accurate alt text, or ARIA attributes, but it will likely highlight issues um, about how easy or hard it is for somebody to operate your site. Um, things uh, like are your search results easy to understand? Do folks find your navigation confusing, especially you know, when they're listening from a screen reader? Um, so the next is understanding that this uh, session is not a guide for a full or comprehensive accessibility audit. Um, so, you know, the common, this is a marathon, not a sprint expression, uh, really rings true here. Um, this session should serve as a diving board uh, into the ocean of web accessibility testing. So, you know, but at the end of this session, uh, you should be able to uh, be more knowledgeable about web accessibility compliance and how it might affect your organization. Uh, you should be more confident in implementing some of these tactics yourself. Uh, you should be better equipped to identify common, common accessibility defects. And then also you should be better prepared to make an informed decision about uh, when and if you should work with a vendor. Uh, so when you first start on your journey of accessibility testing, uh, you should ask yourself why now, uh, since different answers will lead you down different paths. paths. Uh, for instance, uh, are you redesigning your site? Um, you know, if you, if you are, um, you should start the accessibility testing phase when you are writing your project plan or your RFP. Uh, if you are working with an outside vendor, for instance, you'll want to make sure that you cite WCAG compliance in your RFP and potentially even ask for either samples of websites that this agency has done that are compliant, um, or if you're acquiring some type of you know, software application, ask for a VPAT, which is a voluntary uh, product accessibility template, which basically means the person that you're working with has to give you a document stating that, hey, we have been through uh, our, our tool and our service. These these are the accessibility uh, tests that it passes, this is where it fails, and the stuff where that isn't compliant, this is our roadmap to fix it. So all these things are very handy, so this is not something, you know, so even though we're not technically testing anything, um, if you are about to redesign your site, this is what uh, you would likely want to start the process then. Um, and also, if you are in the actual designing of your site, you can start uh, testing the mock-ups and wireframes, thinking about you know, things like color contrast or heading structure, and picking up on the patterns that you know, might be easy for somebody who's sighted and a mouse user, but might be somewhat complicated for somebody who is not using those types of um, input mechanisms. Uh, the next one is, are you doing considerable development work? Um, if you have a site and let's say that uh, you know that, okay, this is pretty much what the site's gonna be like for the next year or two, but we're completely building out you know, this new section of the site. So if you're gonna be doing considerable development work anyways, while you're testing the site, you might want to, uh, you might want to flag some things as items that you can either roll into that scope or improvements that you can make better while you're already doing that. Uh, are you being sued or are you afraid of being sued? Um, if you are currently being sued, you'll likely want to uh, contact an access accessibility expert and not necessarily do these things yourself. Uh, if you're afraid of being sued, then you are in the right place. Uh, and are, or are you just trying to make your website better? Um, obviously a very valid you know, question and very valid answer. Um, and if so, you know, this is a, uh, if you don't have any type of like, you know, pending legal threat or lawsuit, uh, this is a great way to um, you know, dive in and you know, start figuring stuff out on your own and learning. Uh, the next is you'll want to figure out what your bandwidth is. Um, do you have the in-house capacity to confidently identify errors? A lot of times when we are going through um, accessibility testing, it's going to ask you to evaluate things. If you're unsure if you are able to evaluate that correctly, that can cause some problems. And then another question is, 
Do you have the in-house capacity to confidently fix the errors? Maybe you have a very skilled web developer in-house, but in terms of uh, you know, implementing a solution that would be compliant, maybe they're not so sure about that. Um, so if you answer no to either of these questions, you'll likely want to contact a vendor. Um, and when you are contacting a vendor, you want to make sure that this company has a solid track record working with clients in your industry and working with the technology that you're currently using. And then, um, the, you know, accessibility, obviously, you know, this isn't like a one and done deal. Um, if when possible, you know, we try to, you know, at larger organizations or even in smaller teams, we like to create a process. Um, you know, we'd want to create a process out of this. So when you're doing that, you'll want to take the time to standardize your interpretation of the WCAG, your organization's goals, and then the tools that you'd ultimately be using. So. One of the things you'd want to do is, are you working towards uh, the same type of solution? So, you know, a minimum, you know, solution would kind of be like, hey, you know, our site is, you know, kind of a mess. We have, you know, a due date that we're up against. You know, let's get these low-hanging fruits out of the way, and we can revisit this later. Obviously, not ideal, but you know, sometimes that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, opti the optimized solution is a balance between, uh, you know, what we're legally required to do, but also, you know, taking into consideration what the, what the actual, you know, user needs are. Um, and the idealized solution is more so if you're starting a site from the ground up. So this is things like we're baking in accessibility from the beginning. We're designing with this in mind. We have personas that have, um, that have varying degrees of you know, limitations and abilities, things like that. <clears throat> And also, our, you know, you'll want to make sure that you're uh, standardizing and using the same types of tools. Um, inconsistencies between accessibility tests are particularly problematic for people who rely on these tests to identify issues and for their performance metrics. And it's very annoying if these tests are, if the tools that we're using are picking up different results. And so when somebody's going through using a different tool and they're like, oh, this is flagging an error, but this isn't in that, or I'm not getting the same results as you, and it just can cause us confusion and sometimes you know it can you know cause some uh, it can cause us to be a little bit more expensive so we'll just want to make sure <clears throat> that we're all using the same type of tools and another thing you'll want to do is you'll want to identify your Achilles heel so um, you know is there an area of your website or web app that you're just even afraid to touch um, for a number of <clears throat> for a number of organizations this might be your videos and your documents um, you know, so knowing now how many, um, you know, how many videos are on your site, uh, how many PDFs that you have, um, but knowing where your site's shortcomings are, uh, are is important now. So some areas might require a lot of man hours to fix, um, and identifying what those areas are, how you're going to fix it, when you're going to do it, who's going to do it, and most kind of sometimes most importantly, how much it's going to cost. Um, knowing, getting all that information now is going to save you time and hopefully save you a little bit of money. And then also, you know, you'll want to share knowledge and responsibility. Um, you know, subscribe to a newsletter, join an accessibility group on Slack. The more you surround yourself and others with this type of knowledge, the more likely you are to fall into the habit of this. Um, you know, it is not just solely the project manager, manager's job to make sure that, you know, they're checking for things. It's not just the designer's job. It's not just the developer's job. It's all of our jobs. So we want to make sure that you know whatever we can do in our own roles, you know, we're taking ownership and responsibility for that. So next uh, section is building your tool set. Uh, tool set. So automated tools pick up different errors. So standardizing your tool set is an absolute must. Uh, so before we get into this, um, I'm just going to show you some of the tools that I use. Um, you know, nobody's paid me to talk about any of these. Uh, there's lots of great tools out there. These are just some of the ones that I personally use. Um, so the first one is the Site Improve browser, uh, the Site Improve Accessibility Browser Extension. One of the reasons why I like this one is because when I click right on my browser extension button. A nice little sidebar pops up, and it uh, separates uh, it separates issues even into like responsibility. So is this a uh, so is this like a content creator issue? Is this a developer issue? Uh, it's the way that it categorizes some of these issues. I find to be very useful. 
um, kind of one of the newer tools on the block, um, and in my opinion, one of the better tools on the block is the Microsoft Accessibility Insights. Uh, this tool is great, especially if this is something, uh, if accessibility and accessibility testing is something that you're very new to, because what this will do is walk you through all the steps needed to do accessibility testing. Um, so for instance, with, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but for keyboard testing, um, it'll show you how to use a keyboard, the things that you're looking for, why it's important, and examples, um, you know, examples and other resources should you need it. So it's a very, you know, comprehensive and robust tool, and it is free, which is also fantastic. Um, and this is a little bit of what it looks like. So what it'll do is when you launch the tool, it'll open up a separate browser tab. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see the actual automated checks that it's going through. And then on the left-hand side, it'll show you, it'll highlight the areas where those errors are. So it's, it's very visual, it's a very handy tool. Um, I absolutely recommend that you all check it out. Uh, and then in oldie but a goodie, uh, the Wave browser extension. Um, this is something that I've just always had installed on my browser and it's always a, you know, kind of a default in everybody's tool set. Um, this is a little bit of what it looks like. Now, if you're installing this today, uh, it actually has recently gotten a little bit of a facelift. So the, uh, so the UI of it is actually a little bit nicer than it is now. Um, but this one is, but the wave extension is great. It also highlights where the errors are on the page. You know, you can also choose, uh, you know, what you want to test against, whether it's the WCAG level A, level AA, all of that. Um, you can, it also shows you what the, your site looks like without styles uh, and also will flag various contrast errors. Uh, so other tools that you'll need, uh, you know, it might go without, you know, probably goes without saying, but you will want a web browser, um, and you'll, you might want to test in, you know, depending on what your, uh, what tool you have, you might have to test uh, in different browsers. Uh, for instance, I'm a Firefox user, but Accessibility Insights is, you know, only plays well with Chrome and uh, Edge right now. Uh, you will also want a keyboard, so we can do our, uh, our keyboard testing. And then you'll also want some type of spreadsheet or some other mechanism where you are collecting all of these results that you're finding. Um, I, when we get to the testing portion of this, um, I, I'll su I supply a link to the sheet that I currently use, um, which is my method, uh, which everyone is absolutely free to you know, download and make a copy of themselves. Um, but this is a system that works for me, and I recommend that when you are going to this, finding a system um, that works for you as well. Uh, so now, uh, when we're going into accessibility testing, we need to define the scope. So, you know, what are we testing and what are we not testing? So what are some of the things that we should test? Uh, we absolutely want, it's, you know, because it's likely not possible or needed to check every uh, page on your site, um, this is where knowing where your site's architecture comes in handy. So we'll definitely want to, uh, you know, evaluate the home page, uh, any contact page or pages that we might have, and then our top visited pages. Um, also, a quick word about what, we, uh, what we're testing. You'll wanna make sure that when you are testing, you're doing this at, uh, you know, across different screen widths. So you'll wanna make sure that you're validating um, all of the uh, success criteria about, uh, against your desktop experience and then also your mobile experience as well. Quick word on home pages. Uh, out of a million home pages, 98% of them had detectable WCAG uh, 2.0 failures. And this was against the, the Web AIM um, organization. They, what they did was they scanned um, a million of the top home pages on the web and they found that 98% of them has failures. Um, what that translates to is that users with disabilities would expect to encounter detectable errors on one in every 13 elements with which they engage, which is a horrifying amount of errors. So it's very important that when we are testing, we're making sure that these key entry points uh, that our users are coming through, that those are as accessible as possible. 
Uh, you will also want to test the best representation of each type of page. So uh, since we're at a Drupal camp, um, I'm sure you all are familiar with content types. So what I will so what I will do is I will pull up all the pages that we have uh, for different types of, let's say, landing pages, blog posts, and pick the best representation out of those types. You will also want to uh, test the best representation of each type of process. So uh, whether it's a multi-step form, checkout, a registration form, all of these types of things. Um, because in order for something to, uh, for you to be compliant, uh, each, if you have something that's in a process, so like a multi-page form, each page in that process must be compliant in order for all of it to be. So uh, what else should you include? Uh, well, we definitely want to include in areas uh, that we're not testing. So does, this, so does this accessibility audit cover everything except our e-commerce store? Um, and we'll also want to uh, make a list of all the tools that you've used to test. Um, because like I said, it's different errors pick up on different things uh, or different tools pick up on different errors. So making sure that you know, whenever you're handing this off, you have a record of, hey, if you want to you know, reproduce this error, I found this with the site improve extension on this page. Uh, so quick word on compliance. Um, this uh, full page conformance is only achieved, uh, compliance is only achieved if the full page is in compliance. Uh, if part of your page fails, uh, then the whole page fails. Um, and, and since WCAG 2.1, this includes all breakpoints as well. Uh, and then I touched on this a little bit before, but all web pages in a process also must conform. So multi-step forms, things like that. Um, also, all information, content, and functionality must be provided in a way that is supported uh, by assistive technology. Uh, and then non-conforming parts uh, can't block the user's ability to access the rest of the page. All right, so uh, now we're going to go into a quick overview of how to use automated tools, and we use these to find the most common accessibility errors. Uh, so this is the link that I had mentioned uh, to the sheet that I personally use. It's a bit.ly link slash a11y-testing-sheet. So this is what I use to, uh, so this is the tool that I use to make sure that I can record, uh, you know, I know exactly what I'm testing. I have a drop down where it shows all the tools that I'm using, things like that. Um, and we'll be going through with um, the Site Improve, the Wave tool, and then um, Microsoft Accessibility Insights. So I am going to see if I am able to switch screens here. Here we go. This is very small, so please bear with me. So for Site Improve, I think that's the button I'm hitting. So this is, uh, what it'll do is um, it goes through, you know, and all of these tools, by the way, um, they're, you know, unfortunately they are page by page. Uh, so if you need to evaluate multiple pages, you know, you have to run these things on other ones. There are other services out there that, you're, you, that you usually pay for that, um, you know, can go through and scan all of your pages. But if you're not in the position um, to have one of those services, then you will be doing a one by one. Um, so this is a little small for me to even see, so if you can't see, I apologize. But here it can, it'll show you, um, it, it'll group the errors um, by different categories. And then here, if I click on something, it'll show me where it is on the page. So, it's, so this in general is very handy. And then here it'll give you a little bit of information about, um, about what it's testing for and then ways that you can, ways that you can go and fix it. So how that works against WAVE, so this is uh, the WAVE tool I had mentioned earlier that it went through a little bit of a facelift recently, so this is what the new UI looks like. Um, and here it'll give you a general, um, a general overview of the things that it found. Here it'll actually list the different errors, so if I click here it'll bring me down there. It also has a very handy uh, kind of inspect element area here. Um, so you don't have to open up like your own, you know, dev tools. So when I click around, I can actually see where in the HTML these errors are coming from, which is also quite, quite handy. And then the last one is Microsoft Accessibility Insights. 
So here is pretty good. So you can either do a fast pass, which will do something similar to what we saw the other tools do. So it's pick it, it's you know just running through some automated tests and picking up those errors. Or what you can do is you can go straight to their assessment, and that's something that'll walk you through more of like a full-fledged, uh, you know, auditing or testing um, script where you're going through and testing, uh, you know, different like keyboard commands, making sure all of those things are good. Um, so for the fast pass, that's just more of the you know automated. But if you wanted to do a full assessment, you would click that and then. See, this is what it'll launch a new browser um, window, so you can um, so you can start the process. Let's see, and I can't see anything up here, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, but yeah, so here, um, for instance, here's like the keyboard testing areas. Um, it'll teach you how to use it, tell you what a keyboard trap is if you're unfamiliar with that. So this is a very very handy tool. Get that. Okay, great. This is my presentation. to find my mouse now, great. So these are just screenshots of the tools that we just went through. Right, so now um, onto keyboard and manually testing your site. Uh, so this is where we get into, we're evaluating uh, your site's functionality. So for some keyboard testing basics, uh, tab, hitting the tab key will make you go forward. Uh, if you hold down shift and then hit tab, it'll make you go backwards. Uh, enter or space will usually activate a component, um, whether it'll, <clears throat> you know, it, whether it'll trigger like a link or a button, um, or sometimes, uh, you know, toggle drop-down menus. Enter or space is usually is usually the typical keyboard command that does that. And then your arrow keys you can use to move around between different elements. So, um, and then a, you know, a quick word on keyboard testing, uh, depending on what browser you're using, uh, sometimes you actually have to go into the browser preferences to say that you do want to do, uh, you want to be able to use keyboard commands uh, inside of it. So I think in Firefox, that's something that you have to do. You have to go to inside Firefox preferences and just say like, hey, like allow me to use keyboard, uh, you know, keyboard, uh, you know, commands inside of here and then and then you can actually go in and test a website uh, you know with uh, you know tab tab shift all of that fun stuff so when we are doing this what are we so what are we checking for the first thing that we're checking for is uh, a visible focus um, it's when we navigate to an interactive component it is visually apparent uh, a visible focus is typically that um, if you're like navigating around the website it's usually that little blue halo or something that's around an element um, in some browsers it's like a little dashed line uh, but we want to make sure that when we are tabbing through websites we see that because that's how a keyboard user will know where they are when somebody doesn't have a visible focus it makes it incredibly difficult to find you know to know what element they're on and where on the page that they are. Uh, and we're also checking for uh, key keyboard navigation. So we want to make sure that we can navigate to, to, to all of interactive components. We're also checking that there are no keyboard traps. And what that means is that we can navigate away from everything that we've navigated to, we can navigate away from. Uh, for instance, let's say I, I, you know, I hit the enter um, key on a certain button and a modal launched. I need to be able to close that modal so I can get back to the page. If I'm stuck in that modal, that, could, that would be considered a keyboard trap. Uh, we're also checking uh, for things on focus. So navigating to a component does not change, uh, does not cause a change of context, like opening a new browser window. So just by me tabbing onto something and not hitting enter can't cause something to happen. We're also checking for things that happen on input. Uh, so changing a component setting does not cause a change of context, like submitting a form uh, when the user leaves the last input field on a form. And also uh, keystroke timing. I personally don't run into this um, every so, I, I, don't re I really don't run into this, um, but that's not to say that it does not exist out in the wild. But basically all this is, is you wanna make sure that um, no components require specific uh, keystroke timing, like an app only lo like an app only loading if we hold down um, a key for five seconds. Like I said, I personally don't run into this a lot, but that's not to say that this doesn't exist uh, out in the wild. 
Um, so this is, uh, so I briefly showed this uh, previously, but this is uh, for the Microsoft Insights. This is their guide to, uh, their guide to do keyboard testing. So all of the things that, uh, that I just went through, this is, it is like, a, it is a one for one about what they'll walk you through. Um, but it's a very, very handy, uh, it's a very, very handy tool. Um, one of the other things that the Microsoft uh, Insights tool does is it records uh, the focus order of things. So you'll notice if you just keep hitting tab throughout a web page, you're going from element to element to element. But sometimes the uh, where the tab goes, the focus order doesn't really make sense. So it'll record what it is, where it's like, well, why am I going to the search bar before I'm going to the skip link? So things like that, it'll map out where that focus order is. So you can then evaluate and be like, okay, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. We actually need to move this element before that, something like that. Um, so on like the, so let's go to the, let me get my mouse over here and go to the people on the website and you likely won't be able to see my keyboard commands on here, but um, what I'm going to do is just quickly tag through the DrupalCon uh, website to see, you know, kind of how they stack up. So the first thing that happens when I hit tab, um, the first thing, I'm not sure if you can see well, but a skip to main content link comes up. That is something that if you don't have on your site, you 100% want to uh, put on as soon as possible because what that does is it lets me, if I'm a keyboard user, I can just quick hit that and then what's supposed to happen is I'm supposed to jump to main content, but I don't know if there's skip link like that. Yeah, well, so it looks like their skip link isn't working quite as intended. So that's an error that I would put on my accessibility issue tracker. Um, but what this will do is it'll make sure that when I'm, you know, if I'm a keyboard user, I don't have to tab through like every single item on the navigation before I get to the main content. So if I keep on, or let's see, there's another one. Skip to search. We should probably file an issue against them. But so here, I can, so now my focus is on Pantheon, the login, and then it looks like I can access their items through a drop down. Um, I can access their drop down items through um, just from using my keyboard, which is huge. That's a that's a big error that a lot of websites that I've come from uh, that I've evaluated and looked at. A co very common error that they have is that I can navigate through all the top level links, but then I can't get into the links that are in the drop down. So, so far, uh, you know, minus the skip link problems, uh, you know, it looks like the, uh, the focus order of things is looking pretty good. I can see where I am in the process of all this. So right now I'm on summits, now I'm on training, and I can see that all these buttons have different focus states, so I know exactly where I am. So this is looking, you know, minus some you know, troubles, I, you know, this keyboard is looking pretty good, but let's see what happens when I get to the bottom of this. Just gonna, this could, this might be considered a keyboard trap, I don't know, depending on how long I go through here. Oh, there we go. So we did end up reaching the end of it, which is great. Um, and that, you know, and that's something else that happens sometimes too, is that, um, We'll find that, you know, and there's like auto, uh, you know, refreshing things where like you see it on like news sites and stuff, you know, new news stories just keep coming up. I need to be able to get to the end of that if I'm doing keyboard testing. So let's see, let's go back here. Um, and then, yeah, and like I also, I touched on it before, but you know, we'll want to make sure that um, when we are doing keyboard testing, um, that we are also validating this against the, yes? Sorry. Um, from an analytics standpoint, is there a way that I can see how people use my site um, I'm not a, I'm, I'm sure there is. I'm not a hundred percent sure of uh, how you would go about implementing that. I know that I, I have seen a site, actually it was about like two weeks ago, a pop-up uh, came up saying, it's like, it looks like you're using a keyboard to navigate the web. Would you like to turn on like 
access, like, you know, keyboard accessibility features. So there is likely a way. Um, I don't personally know, of, you know, and if anybody here knows of that way, like, you know, please uh, speak up. But I personally don't know of the way that you would implement that. Um, but yeah, as I touched on it a bit before, but you also want to make sure that you're validating that uh, you know everything works on mobile too. So what I do is because uh, sometimes people need to magnify their screens, so uh, magnifying it to like you know 200 or 400 percent until that mobile breakpoint is triggered. So then you can go and test through that too. Um, so basically making sure that your mobile navigation is also keyboard friendly. Uh, so next steps, uh, you know, kind of like, so you have all this like good stuff, so what do you do with it now? Um, so what you'll want to do is, uh, first step would be prioritizing everything. Um, so things that you'll prioritize, uh, basic tasks, uh, creating an account, logging in, buying a product. We want to make sure that all these basic tasks, tasks that anyone can do in our site, those are accessible and that we can prioritize those. Uh, navigation issues. Uh, so if we have skipped heading levels, uh, no skip links, skip links that don't work, uh, focus order, we want to make sure that everyone can navigate our site so that's something that gets pushed up on our, uh, on our list as well. Form submissions, uh, contact forms, feedback forms, surveys, donation forms. We'll want to make sure that any way that a user would need to get in contact with us, we want to make sure that, uh, that they can. Um, because it, the logic that uh, you can't get accessibility complaints uh, if your contact form isn't accessible isn't really a good, uh, <laughs> it's a really a good excuse. Um, another one would be any types of pages that have legal implications, uh, privacy policies, nutritional information, um, pages like that. Uh, high traffic pages, obviously, so home pages, landing pages, if we have a campaign page that's going out. Uh, and then issues picked up by free crawlers. Uh, that is probably, if you can, anytime I'm going through a site and it's like I, get, I see those issues getting picked up by the free crawlers like Wave Tool, and there's a lot of them, I, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh my God, like what else is under the hood? Like if they can't figure this stuff, not figure this stuff out, but if this stuff's not fixed, like who knows, like, you know, during functional testing, what this is going to pick up. Uh, also, this will help you um, too uh, if. You know, let's say somebody's going through looking for somebody to sue. They're going to run that free crawler, and if you don't have any issues that are getting picked up by that, then you know maybe they'll go on to the next. So you'll want to make sure that you pick up uh, that you fix any of the issues picked up by free crawlers, um, and then. One of the things that you can also do too that I always recommend is creating an accessibility statement and putting that somewhere on your page, uh, not page, putting that somewhere usually in the footer that it's accessible from every page in your website. Um, and, and how you do that is you'll want to include information that measures uh, your organization takes to support accessibility. Um, so things like, you know, we include accessibility as part of our mission statement. Uh, we work it into our procurement process, things like that. Um, which accessibility standard your site your site follows? Um, so whether it's uh, you know the WCAG 2.0, 2.1, level A, level double A, level triple A, whatever that is, uh, you want to make you want to include that information uh, in your statement. Um, contact information for issues or feedback. Uh, this is really really important. So you'll want to make sure that the email goes to an actual person and not just info at or webmaster at. So an, an actual person or something specific like accessibility, you know, at myorganization.com. Um, a phone number, perhaps. Um, contact form. Just make it as easy as possible for somebody out there if they're running into an issue or need an accommodation to contact you. Uh, a lot of you know lawsuits kind of come about when a user's tried to contact an organization saying like, hey, I need help or hey, I found an issue. They get bounced around between phone trees. No one's listening to them and then they get frustrated. So we want to make sure that it's easy for people to contact us because we want to know about their issues so we can fix it as fast as we can. Um, accessibility features your site has, if it has any additional ones, uh, like invisible skip links, uh, headers that help define page organization, videos are captioned and including trans and include transcripts. So if there are other features that our site has, you know, let's put it out there so people are aware of it. Um, and then also a known area that uh, 
known areas that have limitations or are not compliant. Um, so something like non-text content, you know, as we continue to move our old content over to our new site, we'll be reviewing all non-text content on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that items have proper text alternatives. You know, something, you know, some type of information where it's just like, hey, we're aware of this, this is our plan to fix it. So we'll have, uh, you know, all content uploaded on our site, you know, prior to this date, we plan to have, uh, you know, captions and transcripts by this date. Give the user information um, because that's just, you know, everybody loves being in the know about things like that. Um, and then time frame of which you reach to expect uh, accessibility milestones. So, uh, you know, videos posted to the site prior to 2014 might lack captions, but by December 2020, all of them will. Um, so things like that. Um, the W3 has some great resources. Uh, they give you an example of a minimal statement, a, complex, uh, a complete or complex statement. And then if you're just not really sure how to write your own, you can go to uh, the very literal accessibilitystatementgenerator.com and they walk you through uh, you know, easy form. You type in everything and then it spits out a document that you can just copy and paste and you know, kind of do what uh, you, know, you need to do with it. Um, there are resources uh, that are in this slide that is up on the Drupal Camp New Jersey website. Um, and in case there are some things that you didn't believe that I said, I have some sources here too. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to open this up for questions, if you have any. Yes. Uh, for websites that rely heavily on advertising and have a lot of you know, external ads that they don't have control over the accessibility of, um, are there best practices for allowing uh, keyboard users or, or users using accessibility tools to uh, navigate around that content or somehow not get tracked by it? Uh, so, if so, just for me to better understand, like like ads that are like a sidebar, those types of things. Yeah, in page advertising, maybe it's in an iframe or yeah, holding my JavaScript and who knows what it is. Yeah, um, so for things that, uh, you know, so if you're pulling in through uh, things through iframes, uh, make sure that they has uh, titles and descriptions of that, um, because when you are going through um, that, if it doesn't have those, uh, those types of attributes in the information, it'll likely get flagged by the, um, by the scanner being like, hey, like this doesn't have a title, you know, you got to add one. Um, you know, if you have a way to, you know, make sure that the ads that are coming on have, um, you know, proper color contrast, that's great. If not, I understand that that might not be something that you have control over. Um, you know, but also to providing, um, you know, I mean, me personally, I, I hate ads, but uh, that doesn't, you know, that's not to say that some people wouldn't find them useful. So, you know, adding alt text on them um, or some type of like description as well um, would be a best practice. Does that kind of answer that? Or? Yeah, what about um, for a, a visitor to the website, um, you know, how can they, is there a best practice for, I guess, flagging where the advertisements are um, so that they understand that what they are encountering is an advertisement and they can either navigate into it and understand it or navigate around it? Hmm. Um, yeah, so depending on how like the site is set up, that just might be something that like it might go through like the you know the focus order, the tab order of things. Um, but you know, with you know following best practices, like you know making it clear that this is an advertisement. So whether you have like a label or like a heading at the top of it that says like sponsored by or advertisement, um, something like that. Um, but if there is a, you know, but, but depending on how that's, you know, all set up, you'll want to make sure that somebody can, you know, get into it, get out of it, potentially, uh, you know, maybe even putting something like a, if, if they tab into it, a, uh, like a skip link, like skip advertisements, something like that, you might be able to do. Thank you. Uh, yes. What's your recommendation on a uh, screen reader? I uh, so I so I use voiceover because I have a Mac computer. Um, I will give a plug to this uh, great service that I recently found. Um, it's called assistivelabs.com. Assistive does not have an e, so A S S I S T I V labs.com. Um, and what this uh, what this gentleman did was. Uh, is everyone familiar with browser stack and uh, you know the cross browser compatibility testing? So this gentleman made 
a browser stack for screen readers. So right now he has JAWS, NVDA, uh, and Narrator. Narrator's the Windows-based one. Um, so, I mean, I personally use VoiceOver, um, but I've been, but since I have uh, been using this tool, I've been getting a little bit more into, uh, you know, JAWS and NVDA. Um, so, I mean, it, it also kind of depends on, you know, what type of, you know, hardware you have. Um, you know, if you have an Apple, uh, you know, computer or iPhone, you have voice, you have voiceover already in this. Uh, you know, newer Windows computers has narrator. So I would say use, um, use the one that's uh, free to you first. Um, and then as you go on about, you know, and then if you're really getting into this, um, you know, then do testing with other types of screen readers. Um, um, for instance, I had a ticket that came in earlier this week um, about somebody using, you know, a using JAWS, and they weren't, you know, and as I was, and I had gotten that information a little bit later, so I'm going through testing with like VoiceOver, knowing that, you know, depending on what screen reader it might be, uh, you know, the issue might be different, but it was fine on mine, but it wasn't okay on JAWS. So, um, you know, being familiar with all of them is really good, um, but for now, if you're just kind of learning how to use it, I would say start with a screen reader that is, uh, you know, that is free to you. Yes? Have you run into any Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Have you run into any automated testing software that you found works well for accessibility? Um, I have, so we at, um, at UPenn, we are using Pope Tech, um, which, is, which was originally Dynolytics. Um, I found that that one is really, really good. I like how you can, um, and this is for, you know, we put in like lists of sites, we can put them in certain groups. And then it just does all of the automated testing for us. Um, we can set it at intervals. We want this every two weeks. We want this group every month. Um, it'll also, um, what are some other the neat things it is? It, you can also say how many pages deep you want it to go in. Um, so, and I think that one's more on like the reasonably like priced side too for like a larger organization. Um, Site Improve, I hear really good things about, but every place that I've either worked at or clients I've had, it's just they've always kind of been priced, you know, it's just been a little bit too pricey. Um, but depending on the, you know, the size of your organization, um, I would say start with either, you know, Pope Tech or Site Improve, they're pretty good. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I use Site Improve, it's, it's nice to get the weekly email to say, Because they also do like SEO stuff too. So Site Improve is, is like a whole bundle of services. I've, yeah. And I work for judicial branch of government, so being law, a lot of people that attend our site don't have a higher education, so they also have the ability scores and stuff. So we try to take it down to a little more plain language instead of a permanent language. Right, right. So yeah, so Site Improve is, is awesome. It's just I, from everything I've like ever heard, it's it's a little pricey. <laughs> We're doing uh, automated them using uh, Sword Side, which is also pretty good. Not, oh, yeah? Not very expensive, but good functionality. You say a Sword Site? Sword Site. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to check that out a little bit deeper. And then you had a question as well? Yeah. So I'm also in higher ed, and one of the biggest challenges we have is getting buy in from our user community. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of content contributors who also double as faculty, and they're tenured and rather intractable, and we had an issue where we got a, a notice that we were being sued. Thankfully, remediated and taken care of without legal action, mm -hmm. and during that time, it was sort of, you know, open common knowledge, and we got goodbye during that phase. Like, okay, we got to clean this up, we don't want to be sued. And now that that has been taken care of, we are seeing that a lot of people are just kind of going back to their old practices and dumping everything on the web team. Yeah. So, is there a nice <coughs> way to get continuous buy-in other than hounding people that you have come across? Um, like yes and no. Um, so, you know, if you already have that, like, you know, kind of that executive buy-in, that's kind of, you know, that's that's the largest hurdle, I think. You know, so you have that kind of support in place where people are like, okay, like I know this is something we should do, but in terms of making sure that 
everybody is doing it that you know that comes with its challenges um one of the things that you know you can and you know that you could try if you don't if you know if your uh, university or college doesn't already have it but forming some type of like learning group or some type of like you know you don't want to call it like compliance group you know because that's a little but you know for lack of a better term um, but you know making sure that like you know people you, you have to make it easy for people um, so whether it's resources on a web page that are just like hey like if you're uploading like you know because that's one of the concerns that we've had right is like you know we have like our learning management system can be you know fully compliant but like the stuff that people are uploading into there like you know who like who knows you and then you have like faculty members who go off and like make their own websites and you're like who's in charge of that so making it really easy for people to like it would almost be harder for them to make something inaccessible than it would be to make it accessible like providing templates um, um, providing workshops if you can work it into some type of perfect like you know some mandatory professional development um, you know there's certain courses that I need to take each year just as you know as part of like my my like employee learning you know working if, if there's an opportunity to bring those types of training classes or resources into that so it's mandatory that they have to do it um, but if not I would you know Having somebody that they can easily go to, whether it's like office hours, uh, having some type of like learning or support group, that makes it a little bit easier. But sometimes it can be really hard to like reel in a bunch of people who have been doing things a certain way for a really long time. So my advice is just make it as easy as possible for them. Um, and usually that's just giving them the tools and the things that they need to do that. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> if you want, if you want to chat after this, I'm more than happy to talk about maybe some of the things that like we're doing to facilitate that. Like, it's a cultural thing. It is. It's a lot of like I've been doing this this way for X years, and I'm retiring in you know five years, and I don't want to change what I'm doing because it's going to upend my process. And, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then sometimes it bless you. Um, you know, and then depending on what you know system like you have, like you know. If there's a way to put in some type of like test before something gets uploaded or published, to like be like, hey, like you can't even do this, like you can't even upload this if you, until you fix these errors. But you know, depending on what system you're working in, that could be completely impossible to do. So, but I, 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 I feel your struggles. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, class dismissed. If you uh, have anything that you want to chat with me about, uh, just come find me. You want a card or anything? Okay.